Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's really a pleasure and a privilege for me to be here with you today and share with you some reflections on a topic that has such relevance and resonance for all of us today. 200 years ago, a cornerstone was laid for international diplomacy and dialogue when the Congress of Vienna brought together ambassadors from all around Europe to design peaceful coexistence for an entire continent. It was a historic first and a success story of dialogue. Just over a century ago, Austria became one of the first European countries to recognize Islam as a religion and anchor this, its recognition in law. That law is also a milestone in interreligious and intercultural justice and dialogue. And just over 50 years ago, the international treaty that establishes the diplomatic relations between independent states was concluded in Vienna, the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. As you heard, I'm the Deputy Secretary General of the of a new, very new international organization, the King Abdullah bin Abdulaziz, International Center for Interreligious and Intercultural Dialogue, a very long name, short, Kaisit. It's based in Vienna. Also, I'm an Austrian and a former Austrian Minister of Justice. Thus, I treasure the mentioned achievements. They demonstrate that Vienna is a city of dialogue and diplomacy. They also prove that dialogue can foster lasting, beneficial change in international relations. That is one of Kaisit's core missions, to util utilize dialogue to build bridges that help people come together and to convert fear to understanding, to provide a path to peace. We also know in Vienna, in Europe, across the globe, that when dialogue is not inclusive or when it does not occur, disaster follows. We meet here today at this forum because we have, we as world, have learned from these disasters. We have learned that without dialogue, there can be no diplomacy, and without diplomacy, there cannot be lasting peace. We know that without dialogue, there can also be no justice. In 2003, France and Germany, advisors in both world wars, overcame that history and undertook a binational project that produced the first French-German history textbook used by public schools in both nations. They now share a story that explains the causes and effects of those conflicts. How could former enemies learn to agree in a common narrative? Through dialogue. This past month, a journey ended here in Rome. It was a journey that exemplifies the role of dialogue in promoting peaceful coexistence and enhancing understanding. An interfaith group in Argentina wished to promote that country's remarkable success in sustaining peaceful relations between Christian, Islamic, and Jewish communities. To spread that message, a delegation of 43 Argentinian, Christian, Jewish, and Muslim leaders traveled to the Middle East and met heads of government. They were strangers at the beginning of the trip. By the time the trip ended, 10 days later in Rome, with an audience with the Pope, the group's members had visited the holy sites of each other's faiths and had, become, and had come to understand the sources of inspiration these religions provide to followers. They had become friends with a common vision. These stories teach us that dialogue works. In this age of globalization, we are ever more interconnected. We are more aware of our religious and cultural diversity. Is that a cause for growing conflict around the world? We meet at a time when global governance is severely tested, whether in the Middle East, Africa, or Asia. More than ever, interreligious conflict is under the spotlight as a major source of world ills. Yet those ills are created when religion is abused to justify conflict and violence. The real cause of the conflict remains hidden and thus more difficult to resolve. Peace under those circumstances remain, remains elusive. This is where dialogue comes in. But what can dialogue do for the religious disputes that afflict so many parts of the global landscape today? In practical terms, 
how can dialogue be used to reduce conflict in long-standing complex situations? Can dialogue be used in new conflicts to reconcile groups so committed to their perceptions that they have forsaken decades of peace in favor or violent dispute? I and many others believe that it can. And that is why I'm proud to represent the first intergovernmental organization that seeks to place dialogue at the heart of the global agenda. The first truly global attempt to bridge the gaps between policymakers, religious leaders, and institutions. This belief in interfaith dialogue and its role in pe building peace and resolving conflict, in helping policymakers build a fairer, more inclusive world, is the reason why King Abdullah called for dialogue in 2005 among followers of different religions and cultures. And seven years later, after much dialogue, Kaisit was founded in 2012. Kaisit is dedicated to promoting dialogue for reconciliation and peace building. We at Kaisit believe that our organization, our work, and the culture of dialogue that we are building is based on inclusiveness. Our multi-level, multi multilateral governance structure allows us to convene policymakers, religious leaders, and experts. The center's founding states, the Republic of Austria, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and the Kingdom of Spain constitute the Council of Parties, responsible for overseeing its work. The Holy See is the center's founding observer, while the board of directors comprises high-level representatives of major world religions, religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. The first step in dialogue is crucial, listening to all parties involved. When we are invited to apply the Kaisit method of intervention, we build dialogue inclusively. We focus on fostering the active participation of religious groups in this dialogue. This approach provides a safer space for dialogue without commitment to any particular solution. It invites participants to build relationships based on mutual respect and with serious consideration of their common values and recognition of their genuine differences. When we build dialogue among believers of the same and different faith, we come to recognize and respect our differences. We also discover that we both hold dear and which principles we share. That process of discovery helps us all to be more just in our respective perceptions of one another's religions. So what is the kind of dialogue I'm describing? It's a bridge from hostility to engagement, from mistrust to mutual understanding, from divergent parochial goals to a convergent mission of great, to greater soci societal harmony. It means actively listening to each other's perspectives on often difficult issues so we can learn more about the other's perspectives on how to tackle the challenging issues humanity faces today. What Kaisit proposes is relatively new, at least in the intergovernmental circles of the international community. We work to create more dialogue between politicians and religious leaders on any issue they find necessary. We want to prevent the manipulation of religious identity by narrow political agendas. Also, we want to prevent religious agendas from manipulating the political process. We need openness and transparency in relations between religion and politics. We wish to help religious leaders achieve an opportunity to play a more constructive role in building their societies. In 2013, we went out in search of answers to all the questions I just raised. When we surveyed experts in Africa, Asia, Europe, and Latin America, we heard the same recommendation. Connect the educational policymakers and the religious leaders. Their networks are fragmented. So we launched a policy network that is unique in interreligious education. The network informally connects experts and governmental focal points from education, religious affairs, and integration ministries. This network brings together the widest possible range of regions and stakeholders to share knowledge and best practices on interreligious and intercultural issues in formal education and lifelong learning, while emphasizing potential solutions. 
Religion and politics overlap in our interconnected world. We are aware that even our most professional dialogical methods, best practices, and benevolent intent will not suffice if policymakers are not engaged. Dialogue cannot contribute towards peace unless it becomes a priority anchored in government policy. Both religious leaders and policymakers then need to pursue, through dialogue and openness, common actions that help communities turn away from hostility and transform mistrust into understanding. CACIT is also working with partners to build peace and social cohesion. To that end, we launched in 2013 a multi-year program called The Image of the Other. Through this program of research, consultations, conferences, and network building, CACITES investigate the depiction of people who are considered to be the others because they follow different religions, traditions, or belong to a different cultural background. Their depiction in education, media, and internet, and social media affects how they are understood and ultimately how they are accepted and integrated. Throughout 2014, CACIT will continue its Image of the Other initiative in education as well as looking at the image of the other in the media, social media and on the internet. Those digital spaces are increasingly influential and are the natural gathering places for the young, especially the young people born after 1995, after the introduction of the web, the so-called digital natives. They are already voting. They will be entering their 20s in about a year. The world view of millions of young people is shaped by images delivered via tablets and smartphones. Kaisit wishes to understand and act in that arena. Dialogue also means partnerships. Kaisit concluded cooperation agreements with leading actors in the field of interreligious and intercultural dialogue, including the African Union, ISESCO, the World Scout Foundation, and the University of Montreal. And in this month, UNESCO's exec executive board will be considering a cooperation agreement with CACID, and we already work together on projects. We are also engaged in close partnerships with Religions for Peace, United Religions Initiative, and other non-governmental bodies. Finally, CACID is beginning to work with mediation experts in formulating an ongoing facility to establish peace-building dialogues that will bring together governmental, intergovernmental, civil society, and religious leaders. In sum, CACID works with many partners in many regions for one purpose, to empower organizations already working on the promotion of dialogue around the world. Empowerment comes from training and facilitated dialogical encounters. Dialogue training is about learning how listening to others is as important as sharing about yourself. It requires time and respectful engagement to be both true to yourself and open and respectful to other people. To aim to learn together about each other. There's a mutuality in dialogue that makes it more than conversation. There is an element of mutual learning and potential transformation. If you should not be yet convinced that interreligious and intercultural dialogue can contribute to greater peace, let me provide another argument. Every major religion is guided by a common impetus to bring about forgiveness between the unreconciled, to promote peace when faced with strife, to sow compassion in the midst of anger, and to achieve justice. These common desires and visions outweigh the differences that superficially separate traditions and cultures. Dialogue helps us to recognize that what we hold dear is treasured by many, many others. That realization can change our perspective and we can see kinship where we once saw otherness. Allow me to leave you with one final story of success of dialogue's power to change lives. Two Nigerian religious leaders, the Christian pastor James Wuye and the Islamic um, Imam Muhammad Ashafa, once were at war. Then they were combatants, not yet religious people. They led militias that fought each other in northern Nigeria. Through dialogue, they learned to lay down their weapons and so to work together to bring peace to that region. 
These religious leaders embody a message of reconciliation in a setting where forgiveness seems to be impossible. It is only impossible if no one tries to talk. If there is one message for this forum that I would wish to deliver, it is this. Dialogue makes all the difference between peace and conflict. That message was true a century ago in Sarajevo, and it's true today in Bangui and in Damascus. We at Kassid look forward to working with you to create dialogue and build peace around the world. Thank you.